walking in sexual purity. So I'm going to begin by breaking down uh, the basic structure of the kingdom and then flow into eventually what is the bulk of the teaching. Again, I'm going to begin by breaking down the structure of the kingdom of God. Uh, that's relevant in the context of what I'm teaching because we're going to have to understand uh, the operation of the kingdom of God to understand uh, the necessity of uh, the doctrine of righteousness. Um, so first and foremost, let's discuss the king, the king. Psalm chapter 9 verse 7, but the Lord sits as king forever. He has established his throne for judgment. So the scripture is now telling us that God the Father is sitting as king eternally. And so before time began, he was king. In time, he is king. And after time, he will still be king. And so God's eternal position and rank and authority is as a king. And so the scripture says, but the Lord sits as king forever. You see? And again, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, the Bible says, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called the chosen and faithful. His name, if there's a name they're giving him, and he's called the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That means that amongst all the lords, he is the supreme Lord. And amongst all the kings, he is the supreme king. The word king means to be supreme ruler. And so God is a supreme ruler. His goal is to rule, to dominate. He wants to domineer over the creatures of his, well, his creation. Inside this kingdom, there is a king. God is king and he sits as king forever. And inside his kingdom, there are subjects. Psalms chapter 22, verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. For kingship to be revealed, there must be subjects of a kingdom. The only way to, for somebody to reveal their authoritative position over someone else is for that person to submit to their authority. A parent's authority can only be revealed in the children's submission to their authority. And so in the kingdom, there is a king, but inside their kingship, there must be subjects to reveal their kingship. And so again, the Psalm chapter 22, verse 28 said, the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. The word nations mean the peoples. You see, so there's a king. And there's rulership and then there's a kingdom which is the domain the territory in which the king is established as a supreme ruler and then there are the subjects which are the yielded vessels that carry out his will you see so there is the king god there are the subjects which are not just mankind there are all the creatures in zion are his subjects and then his kingdom which is his territory his domain great britain is queen elizabeth queen elizabeth's territory that's where she reigns as the monarch she doesn't reign as monarch in every domain and territory. She's not the queen of America. She's the queen of England. England is her territory and she's the queen of England and the subjects are those that live in that territory. Do you understand? And so God is king. There's his territory, which is called the kingdom of God, and then there's subjects. Now, God technically designed everything to be in his territory or to be his domain. And so the scripture says, the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and all those who live in it, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God designed for even this earth to be a part of his kingdom. But mankind yielded over the authority they had over this earth to Lucifer. And so Satan became the God of this world. And so God has done away with this world. He's going to create a new earth and a new heaven where he will again reign supreme over every territory. Heaven, earth, the multiverse, everything he's created, he wants to rule over. You see, and so this earth is in rebellion, it's, it's not allowing God to fully be Lord over this particular territory because of the disobedience of both Lucifer and mankind. That's why this world is being judged. You see? And so there's a king, there's the subjects of this king, there's the kingdom of that king, and then that king, God, has a constitution. Because the subjects of God's kingdoms are angels, cherubim, seraphim, he heavenly Sanhedrin, mankind and various sorts of spiritual creatures those are the subjects uh, but the only way for god to put these creatures under his authority is that they obey him authority is proved in one's obedience towards another i'm only authoritative when i'm able to command a king has authority because they're able to command a parent has authority over the child and that is proved in their ability to command the child authority is revealed in the ability to command 
And so God's authority over mankind can only be revealed in his ability to command mankind. And so he has to put all his creatures under his constitution or his commands, just like the U.S. has a constitution, our code of laws. You see, so that that proves that we're under the authority of the government is that the government is able to command us to obey certain precepts. And God has a constitution and that constitution is called the word of God. You see, and inside the kingdom, when we live by the word of God, that's what's called righteousness. That's when we obtain and preserve our citizenship in the kingdom. Because even in the United States, you are, your citizenship comes with a cost. You must live under the obedience of the government in America. The day that you become a convicted felon, you lose certain rights as a citizen. You can't vote. You can no longer visit a penal facility. You lose certain privileges. You lose certain what we call rights. You see, because you're a disobedient, you've become a disobedient citizen, you see. And so be, being an, an obedient citizen is what's called being righteous. Being a disobedient citizen of God's kingdom is what's called being a sinner. You see, it means that you don't want to partake in his kingdom. You don't want to obey him. You don't want him to be your king, your Lord, you see. And so the only way that he can establish dominion over his creation is that they subject themselves to his word, his constitution, his laws. And when we submit ourselves to his laws, it's called righteousness. We're living as obedient subjects to his kingdom. This is very important that I'm going through all this. There's a king, he has subjects, he has a domain, and he has a constitution. So he's a king, he wants to rule, he wants to rule in a domain, a territory. He has subjects in that territory that he wants to rule, and the way that he rules those subjects is by his constitution. He, God commands men. Men ought to always to pray. He commands men to love. He commands men to give. He commands men to do certain things. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. So on and so forth. All these commandments are an attempt for God to be able to uh, institutionalize his authority over mankind. He wants to be able to function as the king of men. He wants to be the Lord of men. That's why he's called the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the, just a friend. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to own you. He wants to control you. That is what a king does. They own territory and they're in a position of authority and ownership over the subjects that are submitted to their um, kingship. And so God's system of gaining dominion over mankind is to have them submitted to his constitution, his heavenly constitution, which is his word. When God speaks, he reveals what God wants to be done. When he speaks, he carries instruction. That's why the Hebrews called God's word Torah. It means instruction. When God speaks, it was instructive because he's commanding. The same way parents command their children. Don't wake, uh, be around past nine. Don't play video games for more than two hours. Do your homework. Study. Why? Because they're putting them under obedience. They're putting them under the authority by commanding them. When you command one, you're placing them under your authority. And so God only is able to place mankind under his authority by being able to command them us and so jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded forth the mouth of god what does that mean man was designed as a creature that would live under the instructions of god that's why when satan came to tempt jesus and he tried to tempt jesus when he was fasting to eat bread jesus denied him because as a kingdom man god did not tell him to eat and so if he were to eat it would be disobedient he would become a disobedient citizen and so because he is a righteous man, he would only do something if God permitted him or commanded him to do so. And so when Satan and, or Lucifer came to tempt him to do certain things that God did not can't command him to do, Jesus would reply back with God's word. It is written. So Satan said, bow to me and I'll give you the nations of the world. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God only in him only shall you serve. So God commands Jesus to go right. Satan wants, he's called the adversary, the enemy. Satan's ultimate goal is to cause mankind to be disobedient because our, our authority is in our submission to God. He says, submit yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil, then he'll flee from you. The devil is only at a position of weakness towards man when man is submitted to God. The power of man is God. Mankind is created as a creature of weakness. So man doesn't have enough strength to actually face Satan one to one. Man's strength is God because man is created to be weak so that we would depend on God. So Satan only fears you if you're submitted to God. So if you're not submitted to God, he can tamper with you, he can play with you. And so he says, submit under the mighty hand of God. Then when you resist him, he'll flee, not because of you, because of the authority that you're under. You are only as authoritative as you are under the authority of God. 
And that's what Satan's fear fears. And so that's why he wants to get you outside of that authority. He wants to single you out from God and make you feel like you're a, a single entity. You see, a godless entity. That's when he can rule man. Because man was created to be a body. You're created to have an authority over you. Is why it's what we're called the body of Christ. And Satan knows that if Christ is removed as your head, he can plug himself as your head and now have authority over you. And so every man is either under the authority of Christ or under the authority of Satan. Satan is a master marketer, and so he'll make you think that you're in control, but you're not in control. You see, God is truth, and so he'll tell you that he wants to control you. Satan won't tell you he wants to control you. He'll make you think that you get to do your own thing, but actually he's ruling you. Because he doesn't want because he wants to make it look like God's trying to bind you and enslave you, which he is, and that Satan is trying to liberate you. So Lucifer has portrayed himself as the liberator of mankind. Why does God tell you to not have to have sex? Go have sex, go have fun, go do drugs. And he makes you think that you're being liberated, but what's actually happening is bondage. So really, you're either free to serve God or free to disobey God. Either way, you'll be a slave. You're either a slave to God or a slave to Satan. A slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. You're free to serve God or free to serve Satan. You're either going one direction or the other direction. There's no middle ground. There's no place here where I'm not for God or I'm not for Satan. It's not true. The fact that you're saying that you're in the middle ground proves that you're with Satan. Because that's what he does. He makes you think that there's a middle ground. That's how he deceived mankind. You see, when he deceived mankind, he didn't tell them that I'll become your God. He told them that you'll become your own gods. But actually what happened is that he became their God. He didn't tell them because he's deception. He appears as light, but he's darkness. His, his, his modus operandi is deception. And so what happens is that he will never tell man that I'm going to become your God. He wants to make man think that God wants to rule you. I don't want to rule you. I want to help you. I want to help you rule yourself. I want to let you be your own God. It's deception. What actually happens is that when you disobey God and remove yourself from his kingdom and he's no longer your authority, Satan becomes your authority. And so you're free to sin because that's what Satan wants you to do. And so when you're living in sin, you're serving Satan. You may be having fun doing it, but you're serving Satan. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is righteousness, which leads to life. And so when you're serving God, it leads to eternal life. When you're serving Satan in sin, it leads to death. Yes, sir. And so he has a heavenly constitution, the word of God. And the word of God reveals his purposes. The Greek word for logos means the, the revelation of the thoughts of a man. That when God speaks something, it is a revelation of what he wants to be done. And so the reason why God has his system of uh, commandments is that he wants to allow mankind to be an effective prosecutor of his will and his desires. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in every in any evil matter, for he will do what he pleases. The king, the king will do what he pleases. And then he says, since the word of a king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? So it is the nature of a king to do what they please. And so God establishes his own will and purpose. And then he commands man to submit himself for the sake of being able, for God being able to do what he wants to do. And so everything God tells us to do is based on what he wants to do. Yes. So his commandments are based on his purposes. And so when he commands man to believe in Jesus Christ, it's because of the purpose, his purpose to save mankind. The Bible says, for it is God's will for all men to be saved. His will for all men to be saved. That's why he commands men to believe in the Christ. So because when you obey that commandment, you fulfill his will, his purpose. What he wants to be done is fulfilled by you obeying him. Now, next phase, we're going to discuss Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. Remember, we're still talking about walking in sexual purity. I'm building right now. We're going to get there, but we have to go a certain direction. So we're going to start with understanding how the kingdom of God works. God submits men to his word. That's very integral. Hold that in your mind. And then um, everything God commands us to do is aligned with his purposes, what he wants to be done. Now, let's... Put that to the side. Let's now go to Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 11 through 16. The Bible says, speaking of Lucifer, your pride and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Sheol is another name for Hades, which is the, the land of departed, this receptacle for departed spirits. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you and worms are your covering. He says, how you have fallen from heaven you star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth. 
you who defeated the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now in the courts of heaven, this was blasphemy because Satan uh, was not given the authority to climb to a rank of being equal with God. He was made to be subject to God. And Satan grew in pride because of the beauty that God given him, had given him and the glory that was uh, imbued upon his life. And he began to have pride in his heart. He said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit. So he wants to be above God. He wants to run an anti-government that would oppose God. You see, it's like he doesn't want to be subject to God anymore. Remember, I said the kingdom of God has subjects. And Lucifer was one of the subjects. He was submitted to God. But he came to a place where he was no longer comfortable with just being submitted to God. He wanted to be of equal rank. He doesn't want to serve God anymore. He wants to be his own God. It's called pride. Pride is exalting your will above God's will. And so because God's will was for Lucifer to serve him, Lucifer exalted his will and said, I don't want to serve you anymore. I want to be my own God. I want to be like the Most High. He doesn't want to just serve the Most High. He wants to be God himself. He wants to oppose God and be the way he is, having supreme authority. But in that his pride, the Bible says, nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you. They will closely examine you, saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms? And so the pride that was in him caused him to be banished from heaven, down to earth. And so three things you have to look at here. Number one is ego, pride. Satan began to engender pride in his heart. Pride began to grow, where he began to exalt himself above God. He even said it. He said, I will ascend. He wants to go higher than God. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. I will ascend above the heights. Everything is about ascension. He's exalting his heart above God. He wants to go higher than God, you see? But then in that him trying to ascend, the Bible says, nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol, which is Hades, the, the, the receptacle of departed spirits. It's under the earth. So he wanted to ascend, but God cast him down. He wanted to go up, but God cast him down. And so pride, and that's what the scripture says, but we know the, same, the, the famous scripture, pride cometh before the fall. When you exalt yourself above God, what will happen is that you will fall. And so there's pride, ego, pride, self. Because remember, he made five I statements. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne. I will sit on the mount. I will ascend. I will make myself like the most high. It's ego, a self life. God created the subjects of his kingdom to live submitted to God and to submit their will to God's will. But Lucifer is exalting his will above God's will. That's pride. It's self life, self living, being concerned about self rather than in God, putting yourself before God ego then number two which is the fallen state of rebellion where satan knows to do right but he's actively going the opposite direction he knows that as a kingdom subject he's supposed to be submitted to the will of god but he's making an active decision to go in the way of disobedience and then number three which is sin sin is disobedience towards god's law pride becomes rebellion rebellion is having a sour heart that you don't like God, you don't want to obey him. Ah, rebellion is not an action first. It's first a heart posture. I don't want to, I, I want to oppose him. I don't like God. I want to do the opposite of what he says. If he says go right, I want to go left. And it begins with pride. It goes pride, rebellion, then sin. Sin is when you make the physical action of disobedience towards God. Now, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. Whereas we usually know what pride cometh before the fall and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Um, actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to discuss pride and rebellion. These are two important things to understand. 1 Samuel 15, 23, the Bible says, For rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination. In fact, so divination is a form of rebellion. What's divination? Divination is trying to pick into future details and events, not going through the office of the Holy Spirit. So like tarot card reading, where people try to find their future by reading some cards. You see, the only person given the authority to 
in, or decode the future or destiny of mankind is the Holy Spirit. He says, I know, O Lord, Jeremiah is speaking, that the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. That means a man's future is supposed to be hidden in God. And God is the only person in the person of the Holy Spirit that has the authority, that legal access to a man's destiny. And so if any other spirit besides the Holy Spirit reveals a man's future to him, it's called divination. It's a form of witchcraft. You're trying, and that's rebellion. Oh, let's just keep it. Let's not mix terminologies. It's divination, and it is rebellion. You're rebelling against God because you're saying, I want to get the result that I can only get from God from another spirit. So it's like trying to get a fake ID. You don't want to go through the actual government to get the real thing. You want to go another way, don't you? you? And you'll get in trouble because, you see, this is about kingdom and government. This is a government thing. The only, see, government, when you understand certain terminologies like authority, you see, a license is, is the government giving you the authority, the liberty to drive. They're giving you legal access to drive. When you drive without a license, you'll get in trouble. Why? Because you're saying that you're rebelling against the government. The government hasn't given you the ability to drive. They haven't given you the, the license, what we call it, they haven't given you the literal license to drive. You see? And so God has only given the Holy Spirit the license to reveal a man's destiny to him and so when you try to find out your future without going through the holy spirit is called what rebellion then the bible says and insubordination or unwillingness to submit to god is as reprehensible as false religion and idolatry in fact insubordination is idolatry what's idolatry idolatry is the worship of any deity whether real or fake that is not god Yes. And so you see how, uh, for example, how many people worship celebrities. That's called idolatry because you're choosing not to submit to worship God, but worship another entity. Jesus said, it is written, for thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only in him only shalt thou serve. God is supposed to be every man's obsession, every man's drive, every man's passion. When that place that God is supposed to have in a man's heart is given to something else, it can be sports, it can be sex or something. Anything that replaces that place in a man's heart is called idolatry, where you begin to worship something other than God. It can be money, it can be fame, it can be glory, it can be accolades, it can be anything else but God. And, well, I don't wanna go into that one. That's pride and that's rebellion and insubordination and idolatry. Now, so we gave the basic kingdom structure, the fall of Lucifer, which brought the culture of pride. And then now we go into the fall of mankind. And we're gonna discuss that. Now, the serpent, the Bible says in Genesis chapter one or three verses one through seven, the serpent, Satan. Now this is after Lucifer fell. So Lucifer has pride, falls from heaven to earth. Now comes to earth, God recreates the earth theologically speaking and now puts Adam and Eve on the earth. So Lucifer with his fallen state is coming to mankind. Now Lucifer was more cunning than any animal of the field. Lucifer is a spirit, but he embodied a serpent. Was more uh, cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now this is Eve, Lucifer is speaking to Eve, has God really said, you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, Lucifer is trying to, he's attempting to bring a culture, a new culture to mankind. Because as far as Eve knew, all that we do as men is to listen to what God said. That's why she responded that way. Lucifer asked her, did God really say that you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Eve said, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, namely the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we cannot eat. So Lucifer comes and says, did God really say you can't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Eve responds, we can eat any other tree, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So she had been educated to a degree. She knows that because at this point, mankind doesn't know much. We're, we're innocent. We don't know anything but what God tells us. And so all Eve knows is that, um, all God said is that we can't eat any, we can eat any tree, but we can't eat that tree. Now, again, Lucifer's, now actually I have to explain this. Lucifer is a prince. He's not a king. The difference between a prince and a king is that a prince doesn't have a territory. So Lucifer wants to oppose God and run an anti-government. So the same way God is a king and he has a kingdom and he has subjects, 
Lucifer became envious and he also wants to be a king. He also wants to have a kingdom and have subjects, but he didn't have a territory. He was casted down from heaven. That's God's territory. The Bible says the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's. He says, but the earth has he given to men. And so God has a territory in heaven. Man even was given the territory of earth. Where does Lucifer have? Lucifer doesn't have any territory. So Lucifer wants to, he's cast down from heaven and he comes down to earth and he wants to make earth his territory. You see, but the territory of earth is given to men. So what he's trying to do here is trying to find a way to deceive man into giving the authority over earth to himself. So that he can now have a territory because you can't be a king without a territory. You need a place to rule. You can't rule in the air. You have to rule in a place. See? And so he comes to Adam and Eve. Let me shorten this. And we know that he deceived him. But what he really did is that he began to give, man, give mankind the culture of pride. Remember, he himself began to exalt his will above God's will. And he taught man how to do the same thing. Because the only way that Satan can rule mankind is if man is in disobedience towards God. Because remember, I told you, you can either be in obedience towards God and disobedience towards Satan or obedience towards Satan and disobedience towards God. For Satan to have people to serve him in disobedience, they have to disobey God. Serving God is obeying God. Serving Satan is obeying Satan. But in serving Satan and obeying Satan, you're disobeying God. So for Satan to get man to serve him, he must get first man to disobey God. And so he's, he's breathing his culture into man called pride, where man would begin to exalt the will above God's will, thus making, them, making it impossible for man to obey God. Because obedience is really submission. If I obey you, I'm submitting my will to your will. But he wants to make mankind exalt the will above God's will so that they can disobey him and then ultimately serve Satan. That's a synopsis. So he deceived man. And he brought up the culture of pride, living self-life, living life apart from God, exalting your will above God's will. So now that we live a life where we don't care what God thinks, we don't care God's opinion. I live my life my own way. It's my life. It's my body. It's my mind. It's my this, my that, my this, my that. It's putting myself above God. Where did it start from? It started from Lucifer. I will ascend above the stars. I will be like he's saying, I, I, I. It's ego. It's self. A self-life. Self-inflation, self-exaltation. But God is the one that's enthroned. But I'm enthroning myself of, above God. You see, God is king. He's the ruler. But Satan wants to rule. He doesn't want to be ruled by God. He wants to rule. And so he took that culture and taught it to man. Making men think that God would, man would become their own gods. But what really happened is that man started to be ruled by Satan. Because you will be ruled as a man. Man is created to serve. You will serve Satan or you are serving God. In fact, you are serving Satan or you are serving God. There is no middle ground. All that serving Satan means is that you're disobeying God. You don't have to be killing 5,000 people. Just the fact that you don't know God means it's impossible to obey him. Because knowing God is obedience. And you can only know, obey, obey him if you know him. Yes. And so if you're not born again, you haven't had the day when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are currently now serving Satan and you are on a road to hell because that's where he's going. And so anyone that follows him will go where he's going. Is that true? He says, walk with wise men and become wise. When you follow somebody, you go where they're going. Follow them who through faith and patience have obtained. You're, when you follow somebody, you go where they're going. And so when you're in disobedience towards God and following Satan, you're going to go where Satan's going. Are you seeing it? Yes, sir. And so he brings the culture of pride and rebellion. Man begins to rebel against God. We don't want to submit to him. We don't want to do things the way God wants us to do them. Because remember, God has a kingdom. And the way he's able to establish authority over mankind is to submit mankind to his word. And man begins to be opposed, have a natural disposition to be opposed to his word. And so when God, remember I said, when God speaks, he reveals how he wants things to be done. But when we have a new culture of self-life, Living life apart from God. We don't want to do things God's way. We want to do things our way. Which is really Satan's way. We think it's our way, but it's really Satan's way. Satan wants to make us think it's our way, but it's his way. And his way is the way of rebellion and pride. And he taught us that culture when we began to now rebel against the most high God. And from this culture of pride, ah, let me skip this one. So there's the kingdom of God, the structure of the kingdom, the king, which is God. He has subjects, he has a kingdom, he has a constitution. His constitution or his word reveals his purposes. 
Then there's Lucifer. Lucifer has pride and rebellion. He comes to earth and teaches man pride and rebellion so that man can serve him. And so man begins to live a life of sin, disobeying God's law. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. So the definition, the biblical definition of sin is lawlessness, being without the law of God, not submitting yourself to the law of God. You see, you're disobeying God. Now, remember, we're still talking about walking in sexual purity, but I had to lay that foundation so that you understand the state, the depraved state of the human heart. We're in a state where well, the, the man that's not regenerated, the man that's not born again, is at a state of rebellion, in a state of disobedience. We don't want to obey God. Now, we're going to discuss the mystery of intimacy. This is very important. Should I... Okay, the mystery of intimacy. Now we're getting more into walking in sexual purity. Now we have established that mankind has found himself in a state of pride and rebellion because the culture that was in Lucifer's heart has been transmitted to mankind. And so we no longer want to obey God. We don't want to do things his way. We want to do things our own way. It's my way. Now, the mystery of intimacy. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us. Very important. Us is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. And inside that Trinity, the Godhead, the Trinity, synonymous terms, they sat down as three and spoke as one. And in that unity, they created mankind and created all things. In fact, that's how they created everything. You see, creation is tied to unity. So the three of them said at the same time that let us, they all three said at the same So like imagine me here, one here, one here. We all say at the same time, let us make mankind in our image. So all three are saying the same thing at one time. And as they're saying, they're creating in the realm of the spirit. Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock, over the earth. And they're, they're creating in unity. And that is what we call the mystery of intimacy where In unity is where create, creation is achieved. Creativity comes out of unity. When God, the Godhead was unified, they created mankind. They created the earth and everything that exists. Creation only comes in unity. That's why for a baby to be born, two people have to come and unify to give birth to a child. A man's seed and a woman's, you know, they have to come together to be able to create. It's, it's a mystery. It's the mystery of unity and intimacy and creation. And so for creation to come, there must be unity. And so that is the purpose of the God, God creating the concept of sex. It is not, it is trying to reveal a spiritual mystery that in the mystery, let me, okay, let me put it this way. Let me use one terminology to explain it. Let's say, take the terminology of marriage. Marriage is the mystery of two becoming one or not even just two or any entity or two or more entities becoming one entity. So marriage is not about putting a ring on somebody's finger. It is a mystery that reveals the concept of two or more entities becoming one entity. And so God is married to himself. I know that sounds weird. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are married. They are one. They are three, but they are one. That's called marriage. When they are covenanted, three different entities are covenanted as one. And inside that covenant as one they create unity creates or births creation again unity births creation inside that marriage covenant they create that's why god gave man sex inside that covenant of two becoming one in intimacy they now create children do you understand and so god is in the godhead he's married to himself as god the father god the son God, the Holy Spirit, but God now had a plan to create a new species called mankind that would be made in his image and likeness so that he can be a partaker of the Godhead. The reason why God made man to be his image and likeness is so that God or man, God and man can be joined together. You see, so that man can join the marriage between God and the Godhead. He can be a partaker of their marriage. And he'll take one member of that Godhead called Christ and latch him on two men. So there's God the Father here, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, who is the head. And he takes mankind who will become the body and make one man, which is Christ. And Christ would be the head and the church would be the body. 
And so he'll be part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead inside that marriage. See? And so in that unity in the Trinity, the three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit now created. Creation comes from unity. And so Christ was, or God designed for mankind to be married or covenanted as one to Christ. And so marriage, physical marriage, is really just a shadow, a representation of the deeper spiritual mystery of marriage, which is the mystery of two or more becoming one, is the mystery of separate entities becoming one entity. Let me simplify that way. M marriage is the mystery of separate entities becoming one entity. Again, marriage is the mystery of separate entities becoming one entity. That even God himself is three separate entities, but they operate as one. And inside that unity, creation is birthed. And so marriage, and that's why God created sex. Sex was supposed to be a shadow for man to understand God's ultimate purpose to marry man with God himself. So when he created sex, he wanted men to be able to look at sex as a mystery to behold that God's ultimate plan with us is that he, the same way that a man and a woman come together as two separate entities and become one, that's the same way that God is a separate entity than man, but he wants to take himself and man and make them one. It's supposed to be a representation of what God ultimately wants to do with mankind. So he created marriage as a physical institution to show forth the deeper spiritual revelation of God wanting to be the same way that a man marries a woman. God wants to marry mankind. He wants to be covenanted as one. Forgive me, I have to get my terminologies together. Now I'm, I'm clear. Now, marriage is again the mystery of separate entities becoming one entity. So the same way a husband and a wife started off as separate entities, God covenants them as one entity. And that's the same way God is in heaven, man is on earth. God wants to make them one entity where man becomes a part of God. That's why we're made in this image and likeness. For two to become a part of each other, they have to be of the same, the same way if I'm going to wear a jacket, the jacket has to be made in my image. For me to not wear my jacket, I, I see I'm, this shirt I'm wearing, this shirt has my dimensions. It has my measurement so that I can become one with the shirt. So the reason why God made man in his image and likeness is so that he can become one with man. This shirt is made in my image and likeness. It look, it has my measurements, it has my dimensions. So that when I wear it, it's indistinguishable. It fits my body. I can become, see if I move, it moves with me. So that God cannot become so one with man that it becomes indistinguishable. Are you saying that's marriage? That's the goal of even human marriage, is that two become so indistinguishable. When you hear the husband, you hear the wife. When you hear the wife, you hear the husband. And that's how Christ and the church are supposed to be. When you see the church, you see Christ. When you see Christ, you see the church. They're indistinguishable because two separate entities became one entity. That's marriage. And inside sex is supposed to be God revealing to man the mystery of that unity between two separate entities becoming one and then creating forth from that, that unity. Are you understanding? So sex is not just about physical pleasure. It's supposed to be like a movie of us being able to behold a mystery in the realm of the spirit. That wow, God wants to become one with mankind. The same way where two people become one. In that place of intimacy, things are birthed. So that's marriage. It's a mystery of separate entities becoming one entity. God, man, separate entities, he wants to become one entity. Husband and wife, they used to be two separate people from two different families, and they became, he says, a man will eventually get up, leave his father and his mother, and be cleaved unto his wife. The same way God wants to cleave unto man. He says, he that is joined or cleaved unto the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. The same way, it's the same word used. They're joined to become one. That's marriage. And the place of sex is just being able to, uh, uh, another agency by which they exercise their unity. And then that unity births creation. The same way the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit unified together and spoke with one voice and created mankind. When a man and a woman unify in sexual intimacy, they now create. Creation is preceded by unity. That's why creativity is a spirit. When a man unifies himself with a spirit, what gives, what comes forth is creativity. So creativity is not just using your mind to think of ideas. Creativity is a spirit that comes, you understand. 
creativity is like giving birth to a child. That's why when a man has a company, the company is like a child to him because they gave birth to it by a spirit. They may not tell you it was by a spirit, but it was by a spirit. They had to do intercourse with a spirit. You see, these are, I don't want to get into these things. Hey, even Jesus was born by the intercourse between a spirit and Eve. The spirit came upon Eve for Jesus now to be birthed. And he created Christ by the spirit. So creativity is spiritual. You understand? This is not even my discussion, but I'll leave that one. Now. Now that's the pure revelation of what marriage and intimacy is supposed to be. But because of the fallen nature of man, we corrupted it and we took sex outside of the context of marriage and just made it about physical pleasure, which is not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is for us to be able to behold the mystery of marriage, which is two becoming one, you see? But we twist it and say, forget that one. I don't care about God. I just want the, the pleasure. You see, so we began to corrupt it because Lucifer brought pride and rebellion. You see, so we know how God wants it to be, but because our hearts are trying to rebel against God, we know how God wants it to be done. But we push that one to the side and decide to do it our own way. So we know it's supposed to be man and woman, but we want a man and man, woman and woman, woman and two women, man and two men, five men and three girls. We want we want to define our own way. When God made it specifically man woman and a wife husband and wife in a covenant the same way god wants to covenant himself with man is that he wants a man a husband to be in a covenant with a wife and those two would be together and inseparable forever because why because god ultimately that's what he wants to do with man so it's like god giving you a sample of his ultimate purpose with mankind is to be covenanted to be one forever with that's what a covenant is to be one forever that's why orgy and homosexuality is wickedness why because that goes against god's purposes remember i told you before every commandment god gives is tied to his purposes his purpose is that he wants to be covenanted with man and so inside that purpose he now gives a commandment that it should be man and woman in the marriage and so when we say it should be man and man what we're saying is that we don't want to do it god's way we want to do it our way except there's a reason why a man and a man can a man and a man can't bring forth a child they can't create because then a man and a man are not made to be unified. The organs tell you they're not made to be unified. Remember, creation comes from unity. There is something that is disunified between a man and a man. They can't be together. They can't create anything. When anything is barren, it proves that there's no life in it. The proof of life is, is fruitfulness. The proof of life is growth. The proof of life is that it can bear forth more life. When a what? Do you understand? The proof something is alive is that it is fruitful. It can bring forth more life. You can eat from it, you can partake of it. When a man and a man come together, it, that relationship dies there. Nothing can come forth from that relationship. That means God is not in it. When God is in something, the proof is life. That it can bear fruit. Up, oh, so that when that, that relationship can't produce anything, it's a dead relationship. Are you seeing it? Yes. can bring forth any fruit. Now, because of the corrupt nature of mankind, we're beginning to, not begin, we've been doing this for a long time, but we are still corrupting the purity of what God first created with marriage and sex and intimacy between a man, a husband, excuse me, and a wife, you see? And so God doesn't just want me to not sleep outside of marriage because he just says so, there's a reason. When you understand the purpose of marriage, you see, understanding purpose is what helps you use things effectively. If understanding what a knife is made for is what helps me to use a knife the right way. But if I don't know what a knife is made for, I can use it for things that can hurt people. I can think it's a toy to throw around. That's why you don't give knives to babies because babies don't understand purpose. Adult understands why this knife is what it is. But a baby might just take the knife and start throwing it at people. That's what humans we look like. We're children in our minds. We don't understand purpose. So we just use sex. We don't know what it's, what it's for. We just think it's about pleasure. So we just throw our things around and do stuff. 
But when you when God gives you enlightenment and you have spiritual understanding, you'll know the purpose of sex and you will not abuse it outside of its context. That goes for pornography, that goes for masturbation, that goes for sex out of marriage. All forms of immorality are outside of his purpose. A man is not, a human being is not created to pleasure themselves because again, you can't create. That means God is not in it. The proof of God being inside a thing is life. If God, the reason why when you masturbate, nothing can come forth, you just release seed and nothing happens. Why? Because it's, God doesn't approve of it. If God approves of something, the proof is life. It'll produce something. That's why it's only a relationship between a man and a woman that can produce forth the child. Life is proof of God's approval. Oh, do you understand? Yes. Life is proof of God's approval that it can produce something, that it, can, it, is, it has vitality. It doesn't die with itself. Death means inactivity. So when, when a woman and a woman come together, there's no vitality. They just are together, but nothing can be produced from the relationship. But when a husband and a wife are covenanted together, they can produce forth what? Good. And that's even just speaking from the natural perspective. I'm just even looking at it from a natural perspective. See, so because of the disobedience of man's heart, we begin to taint these things. And what Jesus Christ wants to do uh, is bring us back to a state where we, we see things again from God's perspective. So walking in sexual purity is the assignment of Jesus Christ to bring mankind to where they are able to uh, do things God's way again. Walk in his ways again. See sex from his eye purview. See life from his purview. See money from his purview. He wants to bring us and reconcile us back to God because we've been separated from God. We want to do things our way. Christ wants to reconcile us back to God so we can begin to do things his way. So see sex his way, see marriage his way. Um, so Jesus died on the cross. Uh, sin is that thing operating in man that makes us so desirous of disobeying, disobeying God. So Christ took sin on the cross and died with it so he can kill sin. Because if he can separate sin, because sin is what's separating man from God. So, if you, so here's sin, here's God, here's man. He wants to kill sin so man can go back to God. Sin is what makes men to sleep outside of marriage. It's a nature inside mankind that gives us a natural disposition to disobey God. So even though sex itself is good, we take sex and because of our corrupted nature of sin, we want to use it outside of how God wants us to use it. We want to rebel against Him. So we know there's sex and we know it's a good thing, but we want to use it our way. So it's, we, don't, we don't keep it for marriage. We do it anyhow we want. Man and man woman and man outside of marriage having children outside doing things our own is our own way of it we don't want to be defined by god the same way lucifer didn't want to serve god anymore he wanted to do things his own way i want to be my own god he took that same culture which is called pride and brought it to man so we too the same way lucifer wanted to be i want to do my own way man also says i want to do my own way so we're just copying lucifer so what really happened is that we didn't begin to be our own gods. We began to obey Lucifer. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you do do. You do do. So Jesus Christ provided in his sacrifice for mankind the ability to be separated from sin and have the ability in the Holy Spirit to obey God once again. And then we're able to now begin to be liberated from the bondage of sexual perverseness and sexual immorality, pornography, masturbation, all these different things. I'm going to take one day and begin to teach this thing deep. I'm not really touching that. Today. I just want to bring the concept of what it means to walk in sexual purity. It means that you're able to now begin to, and it's not just about, um, is being able to not just not having sex outside of marriage or not just walking in sexual immorality. It begins with an understanding. You must be first reconciled to God, number one. Then number two, when Christ has now liberated you from sin, he now begins to, um, um, let me put it this way. When he takes away the sin nature, huh? the sin nature which now corrupts God's perfect wisdom and then now begins to taint it and we take God's perfect way of doing things and twist it upside down. When he takes sin away, he turns it back right side up. So we saw things from Satan's way in sin. But in righteousness, which is obedience to God, we begin to see things from God's way. 
That's the goal of taking sin away so that we can begin to do things God's way. You see? And so then the Bible now says, Romans chapter 6 verse 11, So you too consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So that Christ separates us from the sin nature and gives us his nature of righteousness so that we can begin to obey God in the spirit. And once we're able to obey God, we begin to do things his way. It's an understanding. You begin to reckon, you calculate and estimate in your heart that, no, I'm separated from sin and attached to righteousness. I can now serve God in the purity of the Holy Spirit and stand in my liberty as liberated from sexual perverseness, sexual morality, and all these nonsense because Christ has set me free from sin. He set me free from the flesh by the work of the cross. And if you want to receive his life and receive that liberty, and maybe watching and maybe struggling with pornography, maybe struggling with sexual morality, all these things are provided in the cross that Christ by his power can set any man free from the bondage of sexual immorality, sexual perverseness, so that you can be able to serve God in the newness of the spirit. Say these words with me, Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sins and raising for my glory. I receive him and I receive his life in Jesus' name, amen.